How you doing? It's Friday, October 8th, 2021. The other day I walked along the seaside here, over there, and around there. This is the new Vancouver Convention Center. And I noticed these little plaques and I thought, okay, I'm going to come back and film this when there's a little more light and we'll call it Vancouver Stories. Vancouver Stories as told by the people that put up these little plaques and I'll just read them and we'll see what we can learn together about Vancouver stories okay come on you got nothing better to do let's do this together Vancouver Convention Center. Think of construction as a sport whose players work in teams, only they're not competing. Everyone is shooting for the same goal. And if one team falls behind, the goalposts move further away into the uncertain future. The rules of the game are natural laws of gravity, stress, and weather that never change. That apply to everyone, and if you break a rule, there are penalties. Sometimes something falls or fails, or someone goes to the hospital. This monument, this, all of this brand new, relatively new Vancouver Convention Center, was built as the result of teamwork. Trades under contract, 144. Structural steel, 18,000 tons. Lumber, if placed end to end, 52 kilometers. 850 workers at the peak. No days lost, no fatalities. Amazing. It's incredible to think of people building this phenomenal building called the Vancouver Convention Center right here in the heart of Vancouver on a crisp Friday. So, here we go. Many stories. One story. The panels, these, on the sea walk around the Convention Center. So we're going to see them all around here. We're going to read them and enjoy learning things together. Tell many stories and one story. True stories, each one a piece of working history. Some stories connect in a series. Others stand in pairs or alone. But they all add up to one story about people who dared to venture to what was for them the re most remote corner of the earth, who carried with them their skills, their families, their languages, and their prejudgments, who having left behind everything that was familiar were open to something new. Remember, for all but First Nations, everything was new. The forests, the animals, the sheer size of the place. Pushed by nature, they became more inventive. Despite conflicting interests, they learned from other cultures and in the process learned respect. In a remarkably short time, these not so common people laid the foundation for the culture of innovation, education, tolerance, and common human decency 
we strive for today. It wasn't easy. These are those stories told here around the Vancouver Convention Center. Pushing the limits. Bouncy. Towering behind the Convention Center stands the most famous building in Vancouver. Once the tallest building in the British Empire and one of the great Arc Deco buildings in the world comparable to the Chrysler building in New York. Perched on a bluff on the water's edge before the railway tracks were built, the marine building was designed to resemble a huge, ornate crag encrusted with starfish, crabs, and other marine life topped by a flock of gecko Canada geese. In 1929, Mayor W.H. Malkin blew a golden whistle, and BC's building trades competed and excelled in the competition for ever higher towers. By completion, it cost $2,300,000. The Wall Street crashed, the Depression hit, and offices stayed empty. The building's opulence frightened people, though rents were reasonable. Briefly under consideration for the new city hall, the deal collapsed, and the marine building sold for a third of its cost. The daring, innovative developers lost their shirts. The city gained a landmark. Workers from the Squamish nation have worked as longshoremen in Burrard Inlet since the 1860s. Despite what the name might imply today, Indian gangs were universally admired for the speed with which they could load and churn around a lumber ship. Employers traded tales of the skill and stamina of native crews. Hired from their home reservations as specialists, side runners, hatch tenders, and donkeymen. A connection between the Squamish leadership in North Vancouver and the work on Burrard Inlet, Chief Joe Capilano worked as a foreman on the docks, which helped pay for a trip to England and an audience with Edward VII of England to discuss land claims. In 1906, Squamish longshoremen established the first union on the Burrard docks. Local 526 of the industrial workers of the world, they met in a hall on the reserve. Despite its First Nation leadership and its informal title, the Bows and Arrows members included Englishmen, Chileans, and Hawaiians. taking it to Ottawa. On the tracks east of the convention center began the On to Ottawa trek, one of the greatest labor protests in Canadian history. During the Great Depression in the 1930s, 30% 30 of the labor force was out of work. One in five Canadians depended upon government relief for survival. Ottawa established military-style work camps for unemployed homeless men. Poor food and backbreaking work for as little as 20 cents a day led one worker to describe these camps as civilized slavery. In 1935, 1,500 striking camp residents gathered in Vancouver demanding better conditions. When officials failed to respond, 1,000 strikers vowed to confront the Prime Minister demanding work and wages. They boarded freight cars on the National Railway, completed in 1885 and stretching across, but on the on to Ottawa trek never made it. 
and Regina police on orders from Ottawa blocked the strikers from reboarding the trains. Instead, eight men were sent to Ottawa to meet with the Prime Minister. Nothing happened. Meanwhile, in Regina, RCMP squads moved in to arrest strike leaders, resulting in a bloody confrontation that left one policeman dead and many trekkers injured. Prime Minister Bennett was defeated in the next election and the hated camps were closed. The Battle of Ballantyne Pier. By 1935, political and business figures in Vancouver had become convinced of a conspiracy to start a Russian revolution on the Pacific coast. Attention focused on the longshoreman strike on Ballantine Pier on the east of what is now Canada Harbor Place. All levels of police were mobilized plus members of the Citizens League of BC, a vigilante organization funded by the shipping companies to save Vancouver from communism. Then on June 18, 1,000 striking longshoremen led by World War I veterans waving the Union Jack marched to Ballantine Pier where strike breakers had been unloading ships. Police attacked with clubs. More squads joined the three-hour fight, including the RCMP and the BC Provincial Police, who had been hiding behind boxcars. They continued to club people as they fled. One fleeing striker was shot by a police shotgun. Reports held that the police had machine guns ready as well, but others denied this. The labor battles of the 1930s stand in contrast to today when longshoremen helped make BC ports some of the most efficient gateways to North America.